Father in heaven, we begin the inquiry by turning our thoughts to thee, to thank thee that thou hast made us so that we can and must seek after truth. We may discern only dimly the path along which thou hast nurtured life on this grain of dust among the stars, until it has been able to take its place as co-creator of complex means and intricate systems that seems at, seem at times to match and even defy their creators. But we thank thee that we have come to this place and time where the possibilities of our own thought and action thrill and frighten us. Forgive us that we are sometimes arrogant, often timid, seldom so bold and courageous as thou art in giving us the, life, the gift of life and the power of thought. Amen. We welcome you this morning to this opening convocation of the third Nobel Conference. We particularly welcome our guests from near and far. In addition to those who have filled Christ Chapel this morning, I would want to extend greetings to students and faculty from the 11 colleges who with us are members of the Central States College Association who are receiving these lectures by telephonic communication. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and by decision of the Board of Trustees, we will celebrate this occasion by the awarding of two honorary degrees. I shall call upon Dean Swanson, who will read the citations, first for Sir John Eccles, and then for Niels K. Stoley. Sir John Carew Eccles, we hail your presence here today. If tomorrow's world of science finds the answers to all the mysterious questions surrounding the physical and chemical workings of the brain and nervous system, if 20th century man solves the mysteries of consciousness, of memory, of learning, and of other mental processes within that complex of all organs, the human brain, a debt of gratitude will be owed to Sir John Eccles, distinguished Australian neurophysiologist, for his basic research on the central nervous system, Professor Eccles, along with two British colleagues, Professors Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley, received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for 1963. The man whom we honor is a scholar of medicine. His advanced degrees, including the Doctor of Philosophy in the year 1929 from Oxford, prepared him for positions of honor at schools and colleges in England Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. He is presently a special member of the Institute for Biomedical Research of the American Medical Association, Chicago, Illinois. As an author, his many publications have aided the research efforts of fellow scientists who seek a greater understanding of the brain and its complex subsidiaries. Because of his distinguished achievements, his presence on the campus of Gustavus Adolphus College is saluted by the faculty and all others associated with this institution. Mr. President, I have the honor to present on behalf of the faculty of Gustavus Adolphus College, Sir John Carew Eccles, the 28th Nobel Laureate to be recognized by this institution for the degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. On the recommendation of the faculty and by decision of the Board of Trustees and on the authority granted this institution by the State of Minnesota, I confer upon you, Sir John Carew Eccles, the degree Doctor of Science Honoris Causa with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto appertaining.
Envoy Nils K. Stolen, we hail your presence here today. The Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation has the demanding responsibility for the operations of the organization which annually recognizes international leaders in the fields of physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. From his office in the Foundation headquarters in Stockholm, he is in constant contact with members of the Foundation board and coordinates the mass of information concerning nominees for the various prizes through the nominating institutions, the Royal Academy of Science, the Carolin Institute, the Swedish Academy, and the Nobel Committee for the Norwegian Parliament. Since 1948, this office has been in the capable hands of Envoy Nils K. Stolen. His life has been one of service to his country and the world. Following his degrees at Lund and Oxford, he entered the Swedish Foreign Service in the year 1927 and has been involved in international relations between his Swedish homeland and the world which continues with his official association with the Nobel Foundation. The man whom we honor is one of, of many talents and interests. He is a member of several banking and industrial companies and holds honorary degrees and foreign citations for his service. Because of his distinguished achievements, his presence on the campus of Gustavus Adolphus College is saluted by the faculty and all others associated with this institution. Mr. President, I have the honor to present on behalf of the faculty of Gustavus Adolphus College, Nils K. Stoli for the degree, Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and by decision of the Board of Trustees and on authority granted this institution by the State of Minnesota, I confer on you, Nils K. Stoli, the degree, Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto appertaining. Two preliminary announcements to those who are gathered in the chapel with us. You are invited to submit questions at the conclusion of this and other sessions on the forms which have been provided you. They will be passed to the ushers and as many as time allows will be handled by the lecturer at the conclusion of his lecture. The remainder will be considered at the closing panel tomorrow afternoon. You are also advised the tickets for the various sessions are honored up to 10 minutes prior to the start of the session, after which non-ticket holders are, will be admitted. A large screen closed circuit television is available for overflow in the main lounge of the student union. Now I am pleased to present to you Sir John C. Eccles, who will speak on the subject, Evolution and the Conscious Self. Dr. Eccles. Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted and greatly honored First of all, at the honorary degree that I have been so graciously awarded, and then also at the invitation to give this talk at the third Nobel Conference here in this most wonderful and beautiful chapel. I have never in my life had the opportunity of talking to, in such a, shall we say, marvelous surroundings and to such a fine audience. Thank you. Now, this talk that I am giving is one which is very deeply concerned me and I am sure all of you. 
It is one that has been in my mind, my brain, for some long time, but it is only the occasion, uh, such as this invitation, that has caused me to put some of my ideas down and to try to present to you a story that is of such intimate and vital concern to us all. I want you to realize with me that we are participants in this evolutionary process of life. And also to recognize that it is only for the last hundred years or so that man has in fact recognized this. Now this is a short time in human history. And it is quite certain that the full implications of this reappraisal of a man's position in the world has, have not yet been uh, realized by man. We have, as it were, various tentative ways of looking at it, but we haven't yet achieved what I would say full human wisdom in respect to this great problem which is at the origin of us all. There are now, however, in recent years, several examples of what I might call a wise evolutionary philosophy coming uh, forward by different people. Uh, I instance Dobzhansky, uh, Simpson to some extent, uh, Lack and Thorpe in England and so on. We are, have got now before us efforts being made by evolutionary biologists to reappraise the whole human situation. I want, first of all, uh, to get you to realize that evolution is a kind of procession. It is a most wonderful procession of life. It's been going on for something like two to three thousand million years. And we are actually in this procession. It's a procession of the most wonderful productivity in biological forms. And we are engaged in it because we can trace our genetic descent from the most primitive living organisms. And I have a vision, as it were, that we are in this great procession moving through time that we can look back on it but not forwards. And so, in, as I look at it, it seems as if the procession is going this direction and we are walking backwards and we can look into the fir past further and further and get evidence from the uh, writings and then the artifacts and then just skeletal remains of what went on before us. And this is the most marvelous explorations are being done in that respect. And we can imagine and recreate in thought what might have happened in those past ages. But we don't know what is in before us or as it, because we're only looking backwards. We don't know what occur, is going to happen in the direction of our movement. We can predict a bit, but we don't know. Now, of course, the position of many people is that they think they're onlookers in this procession and they can look at all these living forms and other humanity, the rest of humanity and so on uh, with some degree of equanimity and uh, detachment. But I cannot do that and I don't believe any sane man who's thought it out can because we are actually in the procession. We belong to it. It has given us our actual chance of existence. Of course, this is, if you like, an embarrassing or fearful engagement to think of this, all the exigencies of these past situations that somehow or other have given rise to the evolution of man and eventually to us. But that is the way we have to look at it, fearful or embarrassing as it may be. Well, now... I come to uh, just a few words about the modern theory of evolution because this talk of mine, evolution and the conscious self, has to at least be firmly based upon what biologists have now 
discovered as to the mechanism of evolution. There are two aspects or sides to our modern theory of evolution. And these, I think, are now so well established that we can take them as secure building for future, the future work. Firstly, there are the changes that are wrought in the genetic code by random mutations. There is a complete randomness about this. As it were, it's a kind of chance operation. The DNA structure, the deoxyribonucleic acid structure, is all the time changing in its actual molecular configuration. These are the mutations, and as a consequence, the DNA being the operative, giving the operative instructions for the creation and development of each organism, you can get a changed organism because, or you do get a changed organism because of change in the DNA. This is all very well established. But most changes, the tremendous majority of mutational changes, which are simply a change in, a, in this enormously complicated molecule, uh, which is the constituent part of our sex cells, this, most of these changes are unfavorable. You understand that this changes in the sex cell, which then unites to give an O-fertilized ovum, and this in turn the development of a uh, human being us, if you like, each one of us. But most of these mutations are unfavorable, an enormous number. Only the very rare one gives an improved chance for survival. Now, it's not right that we should look at it when our nice, comfortable uh, conditions of civilized existence. We have to think of this happening in natural conditions, in the struggle for survival was at its fiercest. And this survival of favorable mutations, giving better opportunities for existence, uh, is called a natural selection. And this was, in essence, the key of Darwin's concept. He didn't understand mutations at all, but he understood natural selection. So what we have then in this uh, two completely different uh, biological processes joining together to give us evolution. The one is the blind groping, if you like, completely blind, trying everything as in a blind manner uh, in the way of DNA change. And the other is the highly selective process that occurs in natural selection. Everything, if it way, as it were, can be tried and then the most severe selection put upon it. And that is, in essence, the evolutionary story. And this, in all its full development, must rank as one of the grandest conceptual achievements of man. Now, this story, as I've given it to you, you may think, well, that's very nice, uh, that explains us. But it's now recognized by people like, thinking as it were, like Dobzhansky or Simpson and others, that there isn't just a simple continu continuum of this kind like I have sketched. At two stages in the evolutionary story, there was something very exceptional happened. The first one, turning what they call turning points or transcendences, and the first, of this, first transcendence was, in fact, the origin of life. How did it begin? And the second is, of course, the origin of man, and that is the theme of my talk. I quote from Dobzhansky here, this uh, great evolutionary geneticist of New York. The origin of life and the origin of man were evolutionary crises, turning points, actualizations of novel forms of being. These radical innovations can be described as transcendences in the evolutionary process. Human mind did not arise from some kind of rudimentary minds of molecules and atoms. Evolution is not simply unpacking of what was there in a hidden state from the beginning. 
It is the source of novelty, of forms of being which did not occur at all in the ancestral states. Now this does not mean to say, of course, that the origin of life or the origin of man was some instantaneous or catastrophic event. It was certainly rapid in geological time, though, so far as man's origin was concerned. But it, the origin of man, we can think, was one of those two great fateful transcendences which marked the beginning of a new era. Now, I am not really going to deal uh, at, any, at all with the origin of life. That is worth a whole conference in itself. But I come now to the other transcendence, the origin of man. There is no special problem, evolutionary, even about the origin of man's body. There is no missing link. That was the story I was, as a young man, brought up on. There were apes and so on, and it was quite clear that we had descended from apes in some way. But the links were missing, but now they are not missing. This marvelous research that has been done in different parts of the world in recent decades, in Africa in particular, in China, in Java, and so on, have now disclosed all the main sequences lying behind man's origin as a material body. Of course, I accept this explanation of my own origin. I cannot doubt it. My body is part of the whole evolutionary story. I cannot doubt my animal ancestry. And I cannot doubt, in view of all that biological science has now discovered, that this was the operation of mutations and natural selection during these thousand-odd million years of evolution. But as I want to tell you in this lecture, I do not believe that this theory provides a complete explanation of my origin. Now, don't be alarmed about that. This is quite a scientific statement. I don't believe, actually, that any scientific theory today no matter how well supported, is a complete story. The days when we thought science gave us absolute truth of one kind or another have passed. The Newtonian physics, for example, has had to be rejected for new conceptions of the nature of matter and behavior of matter. All science can do and should claim to do is to give you and explanations as far as possible of how, uh, of the, of, shall we say, natural processes. But not the ultimate story. I don't, I'm not denying the existence of ultimate stories. All I'm saying is that we must never claim to tell the ultimate story. And so I'm saying this about evolution that we have a marvelous story here, but I do not believe it is the complete story. I can't tell you what the complete story is naturally, but I want to reserve judgment about this. It fails to explain me to myself, my origin as a person, with my unique, if you like, unique to me, self-awareness and a person and individuality. Now what do I mean by this conscious person? I think I should just indicate uh, in a few sentences what I 
a remarkable thing, this self-consciousness is, that we all each know and recognize in ourselves. And in fact, it is the only way I can talk to you about it is to ask you to think of what you are yourself and your own experiences, of the inner illumination, if you like, that we know so well and have lived with so long that the character of it is perhaps too readily accepted and not appreciated. Of course, there are, as one side of it, it's quite simple to talk about, and that's perception. As I look around the room, or you do, we see all the environment laid out, and you hear sounds and so on. I want you to realize that there's no color in the natural world, or no sounds. And nothing of this kind, no textures, no patterns, no beauty, no sense, nothing of this kind. These are all, in fact, perceptions which come to us because of our sense organs. And in some way that we don't understand, they're transmuted into thoughts, perceptions, experiences, if you like. But we do not know how this happens at all. Except, but we do know that it is, of course, the first reality. Everything else, how we interpret all this, is derivative. So that is one side of our conscious experiences. And the other side is what I call inner experiences. Not something immediately observed, the transience of phenomena, but the inner experiences that we live with all the time, with our memory for example, recall of all our past. But all the texture of thoughts and ideas, deliverances of the imagination, emotional feelings, and so on, volitions and desires, and everything that goes into our waking life. And we can look back in memory through the, the past, and this gives us the continuity of what we call a self making up our own personal existence and our own personal identity. Now, this is what I mean by the conscious self. And it is this part of myself that I cannot see explained in the present evolutionary story. There are various ways that you can look at this when we come to consider the story of the evolution of man, I can give you some, uh, another quotation, if you like, from Fromm, a recent one. Man has intelligence like other animals, which permits him to use thought processes for the attainment of immediate practical aims. But man has another mental quality which the animal lacks. He is aware of himself of his past and of his future, which is death. Man transcends all other life because he is, for the first time, life aware of itself. This is where the transcendence comes in, life aware of itself. Man is in nature, subject to its dictates and accidents. Yet he transcends nature because he lacks the unawareness which makes the animal a part of nature, as one with it. Now, you may not like me saying that animals have unawareness, but I mean it in a special way. For example, you can say this, for example, of your dog or any other animal. An animal knows, but only a man knows that he knows. That's not original with me, I imagine. Uh, Now, Dobzhansky goes on to say, and this again points to this transcendence. The bio biological species from which mankind has descended had only rudiments of self-awareness or perhaps lacked it altogether. That is, he didn't know that he knew. The self-awareness has, however, that came with after this transcendence, wherever it was in the origin of man, this self-awareness 
brought in its train somber companions, fear, anxiety, and death awareness. Now, I will pass over quite quickly a remarkable effort that has been made by thinkers to eliminate this transcendence. It's an extraordinary thing. People don't like steps or jumps. They like to have smooth operation. And so we have the most amazing postulate put up by eminent thinkers. I can think of, we quote, Tyler de Chardin or Sherrington or Julian Huxley. And that is that there is some mental attribute in all matter. That, and this has only become gradually perfected and developed in the evolutionary process until it is what we know it to be, experience ourselves. Uh, my comment on such a statement as that is that I don't know what they're talking about. They use mind and mental in a way that is nonsense to me. Uh, I can only think of mind and mental as something equivalent to my conscious experience. I don't want to use mind and mental for any, if you like, even purposive operation or any apparently reaction of an uh, adaptive kind or anything of that. This can all be explained quite well in biological terms without introducing these words mind and mental. And in fact, let us be clear about this and see what nonsense it is, that the, we only have this conscious experience I'm talking about when certain parts of the brain, the higher levels of the brain, are in certain special states. Not all the time. I hope very much that you were unconscious for several hours last night, for example, having no mental states, nothing in the way of conscious experiences. That means you had a good night's sleep. Uh, but your brain was still there working all the time. You see, it's, uh, mind and mental mentality are not, as it were, even the properties of your nervous system all the time, only a ti part. And a more remarkable example is even that uh, when, uh, as recently in Los Angeles, for therapeutic re reasons, our brain was split to stop an intractable epilepsy. It cured the epilepsy, but the, in the split brain patients, uh, it was discovered that all the goings on in the minor hemisphere were unperceived uh, by the subject. This part of the brain had apparently been, as it were, amputated from that region of the brain, giving it conscious experiences to that subject. We don't know at all how this happens. But it does raise very much the point, you see, that we should not lightly assume this mind and mentality in any matter or even in highly developed nervous systems such as, for example, a chimpanzee would have. He may, I don't deny the possibility of awareness, self-awareness to animals, of course. All I can say is that the only justifiable attitude to this is agnosticism, to say we do not know. Well, now I come to the story, the factual story, as we can now reconstruct it right back through the last thousand, uh, through the last million years. So we're now not from thousands of millions. That's the whole of life. One million is the story of man, man's origin. One million years ago, there were primitive descent, uh, primitive ancestors of men in Africa, Tanganyika and Transvaal, Australopithecus. Uh, whether they are man or higher spatial developments of apes is not yet certain or not yet been agreed upon. But at least 
this is certain, that they were on the way, and that we have arisen, I think, from uh, beings of this kind, which are now very well uh, known from the amazing fossil discoveries of the last few decades. Uh, we go on. Uh, the, they did have, there's generally agreed evidence now, that they had primitive pebble tools, just little bits of stone, not formed at all much, but did use them, which is more than any animals really do. They did some, as it were, selection and construction and, and preservation of such tools. But their brains were quite small, uh, 500 cc's. Now, uh, to give you some idea of uh, the brains that uh, you would be uh, carrying into this room with you, uh, the varies, I suppose, from uh, perhaps uh, 1,200 cc's to perhaps there may be a few people, I won't say they're geniuses, with 1,900 cc's. Actually, there's no good correlation about brain size and uh, intelligence. Uh, but if you have too small a brain, I'm afraid that's just too bad. Uh, uh, however, within the human range, and, uh, and uh, with women with smaller bodies have smaller brains, but that doesn't mean they're less intelligent. They get on ex extremely well uh, because everything is built on a slightly a smaller scale. They have as many nerve cells and as much complexity as the larger uh, brains of man, and there's only 10% in it anyway. And if you want me to go on with this story of brain size, remember that a whale has a brain at least five times heavier than what we carry around, but he doesn't do much with it. Uh, it's not just size that counts. But it's the only criterion we have in judging primitive man is brain size, which can be got from skull size. The skull has been preserved. You understand, we're looking back in this procession. We're gazing back a million years. Now, a few hundred thousand years later, and this is a long time, you can imagine the ages of struggle of these primitive men with their 500 cc's of brain and a few simple tools. This, the static state of this uh, period of history must have been quite fantastic. You know, we're apt to think that in the Orient, in China, for example, uh, a thousand years counted as nothing, that the stability, or in Egypt, another example, where we had two or three thousand years of stable history with almost no change. But I'm talking now of 500,000 years, which was the history of these primitive men in Africa carrying on uh, primitive ancestors, we won't call them men too much, uh, carrying on with some kind of survival under the most extraordinarily difficult conditions uh, with all of the large animals as competitors in this survival. But 500,000 years ago, we next get a glimpse of the picture, and it has changed because we can pick up at almost the same time now uh, primitive men, surely men now, Homo erectus, walking uh, and with a posture like ours, with brains coming up very much now, and who had learnt quite a lot. For example, um, the Pekin man has a brain of at least twice these primitive precursors in Africa. This is a remarkable thing, this growth of brain something that is quite unexplained. How did it come about, even in 500,000 years, to more than double the size of the brain is a, an extraordinary evolutionary achievement because it was an evolutionary achievement of mutations and natural selection. Primitive man then, uh, Homo erectus in Peking, actually had domesticated fire and uh, quite clearly had used fire uh, and preserved it and the remains of bones and the fire and so on for cooking and things of this kind. Uh, this was uh, dating some hundreds of thousands of years ago. And we have, as it were, other examples in uh, Africa, in Europe, and in Java of men of that period. 
Uh, and there are isolated examples here and there over the next few hundred thousand years. But the real, uh, really where the story begins to be of interest to us, particularly for, in the relation to this lecture, is a hundred thousand years ago. During the last glaciation, the last glaciation you may be interested to know is known over the world as the Verm Wisconsin glaciation. I take it that the glaciers went a bit further south from where we are now uh, at that time, uh, in, down into Wisconsin. Now, during this rugged period with this last ice age, and it possibly uh, did help. You're not, living in this climate, you'll be pleased to know that, that a rugged climate helps. Uh, it did help the evolution of man, and Neanderthal man, as he's called, because the first uh, remains, skeletons, were found in the Neanderthal Valley. Neanderthal man on the scene 100,000 years ago, Homo sapiens for the first time, wise man. Living in Europe and East Asia, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, and through into Europe. He had fire and primitive stone tools which he fashioned. Flints and so on, the chippings of flints now become more and more evident and probably use animal skins for clothing. And his brain capacity, this is important, was matched ours, 1400 cc's. And so he had, and you can well believe that such men, if you could find them today, uh, could be uh, civilized and become members of our society, although they are not, in fact, members of our race. That's Homo sapiens. Now, the really important thing now is that quite indubitably, these men had a primitive spirituality. And I don't be alarmed, I give the reason for this, because they buried their dead. This is quite certain that Neanderthal man took a great deal of interest and developed burial customs appropriate. This is, I think, the first clear evidence of the dawn of self-consciousness, knowing that you know attitude in uh, prehistory. The evolutionary process then, 100,000 years ago, had clearly given rise, not only to a man with a brain full size, but to a man who thought about himself and his fellow beings, and was able to, as it were, get impressions and ideas of selfhood and humanity, and no doubt the feeling for others, which goes with death awareness and burial customs. As these harsh conditions, but there's a sad story to it in a way, as these harsh conditions retreated, Neanderthal man disappeared. He was perhaps not exactly a prepossessing individual. He was long-headed with a big brain, but short and stocky and stooped uh, and crafty. But he survived through this tough period and then 30 to 40,000 years ago, 35 to 40,000 years ago, no more traces of him. And what we have then is modern man, Homo sapiens sapiens. I don't know why they have to keep on adding the wisdom, but uh, it's uh, uh, what we call ourselves, uh, and we must be very flattered by the name we find ourselves spoken of, <laughs> have spoken about. Now, this modern man, wandered rapidly over the face of the earth. 25,000 years ago, he was developing, exploring America and going all the way down the American continent. He wandered over the whole of Asia and Europe and even to Australia. He is the wandering, colonizing race to which we belong. But we don't know yet the site and mode of action. 
He apparently didn't arise in Europe. He came from outside. He first appears in Europe, but with no, as it were, traces of his origin there, as if he came fully formed in Europe, Neanderthal man being eliminated. Now, I'd like to give you a few thoughts about how we can assess this self-awareness of man. How can we look at man back in these early times of our origin? I want you to realize something that is not usually appreciated by people, and that is that no animal in a wild state displays any concern for its dead. There is not even a primitive attempt to dispose of the body which is just ignored. This happens, so far as is known, even for anthropoid apes. But more evidence is required. There. But this looks like as if this is a quite certain difference in, between human behavior and the behavior of even the highest animals, and that's why I made the special point about Neanderthal man has having crossed the threshold for, with respect to uh, the burial customs. And from that time of 100,000 years on, we have records of the most extraordinary development in these burial customs, ceremonial burials. You can be sure that these were ceremonial burials, that they didn't just put the body and cover it up to get rid of it, because the body was lying with tools and implements and headgear and all kinds of magical associations. This is certain it was ceremonial, not just disposal. And so we have then uh, this amazing inventiveness of man in respect to the dead and how to handle and treat them. No doubt it was partly not always love, it might have been fear or dread or to fear that the spirits might come and haunt you, but at least motivating this whole uh, operation, there was the belief that the dead uh, person had had a spirit, a self-consciousness awareness, such as you know yourself, and which you have to act upon this belief after they die. And so you have, even in some cases, these uh, dead bodies have been covered in red ochre, probably to make them look as if they were still alive. They're painted up. And they're, they're associated, as, it, as I said, with all kinds of objects. There's a small boy's cave in one place uh, where they have the horns of animals all nicely draped around the body. All of this has been now unearthed. The first of these tombs actually were discovered in Palestine. And then, of course, you are aware of the way this has gone on through the ages uh, with, for example, a great civilization like the Egyptian that was principally centered upon uh, death customs with these great tombs and monuments. As Dobzhansky said, the cardinal fact is that all people everywhere take care of their dead in some fashion while no animal does anything of the sort. Um, it's now, because of this, we can think that 100,000 years ago, we had the dawn of humanity. It could have been earlier. We have no record of this. The first self-conscious beings then were in existence so far back. And later on, of course, and now we get uh, to tens of thousands of years ago, we have the uh, Homo sapiens, sapiens that came 30 to 40,000 years ago, as I said, and 10,000, oh, no, 20,000 years ago, we already have now man with highly developed art in his carvings and in his paintings. If any of you have been to Lascaux, I hope you have, you'll see the most amazing artistic skill of men 
20,000 years ago, probably painted for magical purposes in these caves and showing an artistic, artistic development, an ability to display animal form and motion and action, which uh, makes you feel if you could only meet such people and communicate with them, it would be a very rich experience. No doubt these people had a highly developed language. That we can never know. Because, of course, you will understand, written languages came very much later than spoken languages. And a large part of the peoples of the world today have, of course, a spoken language and not a written language. And when there is no written language, then there is no way of ever discovering what, in fact, and when linguistic communication of ideas developed. But the remarkable thing is if we take Homo sapiens sapiens, and that's all the races of the world today, all belong to the same, not only race, but the same species of mankind, but the same race. If you take them all, no matter how primitive their existence, they have a highly developed language. I quote Susan Langer, if we find no prototype of speech in the highest animals, and I want you to realize that animals cannot be taught speech. They can understand what you say, but the best effort in existence so far is a young uh, chimpanzee that after two years of solid teaching learned three words, papa, mama, and cup, and only used them under duress. Now, uh, that shows that something is different in the brain of a man from an ape. And Suzanne Langer has particularly emphasized this. No prototype of speech in the highest animals. And man will not even say the first word by instinct. Then how did all his tribes acquire their various languages? Who began the art? which now we all have to learn. And why is it not restricted to the cultured races, but possessed by every primitive family, from darkest Africa to the loneliness of the polar ice? Even the simplest of practical arts, such as clothing, cooking, or pottery, is found wanting in one human group or another, or at least found to be very rudimentary. Language is neither absent nor archaic in any of them. And in another place, she goes on to say that even these primitive people converse in a tongue as grammatical as Greek and as fluent as French. So language and the origin of language was something most important in the development of thinking man but we do not know anything about it. But we must assume that people who could draw in this marvelous way as the cave paintings already had a highly developed language matching at least the people who paint today in caves as in, say, native Australians, as I know, and who have very highly developed languages themselves. Now I come uh, to a few other, there is so much to say in this story, I will have to leave things out. Unfortunately, it will all be written anyway. Um, did uh, self-consciousness come suddenly, or how did it develop in developing man? I'm a bit attracted by the idea put forward in general that it re it's recapitulated a little in our own development as a child. I don't say this is the full story, but at least it can give you some impression. Just as, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, it comes, you see, consciousness is, as it were, as we go back in memory, first little flickerings and gaps of quite simple, perhaps, uh, pictures or something that we've seen, gradually becoming, uh, and, and uh, shall we say, remarkable occasions, gradually becoming more sophisticated, more continuous, and on until the present time. 
Of course, you could say uh, that, uh, say, very few of us can remember anything, say, younger than a year old, and you might say, well, we were unconscious then. This isn't, of course, true. You, uh, it may be that you've just got a bad memory, uh, that you were conscious but can't remember it. Uh, so these tests aren't so very good. Now, another question that I could raise is uh, the development of brain size. How did it come about, this 500 cc's coming up to 1,000 and 1,500 and so on? It's generally believed that when man came down from the trees, where he was having to use his hand all the time, not man, the precursor of man, and could stand on his two feet, which is something that anthropoids don't do very well, anthropoid apes, uh, they can run a little bit, but they're mostly putting their hands down. But man, in his earliest times from the skeletal remains, was a uh, primitive man, was walking erect and could have his two hands free for using tools and develop tools. And so from tools to brain, backwards and forwards, more complexity, more performance, more survival, natural selection operating and skills. And so man, as it were, grew a brain because he was a mechanic and the two of them were talking to one another. He became a better mechanic because he had a better brain and they survived better and so on. And this kind of tool usage and survival under natural selection is probably uh, the driving or the biological explanation of this growth in brain size. I now come to the question, and uh, this was referred to by a president in his opening invocation. Here we are on this little planet of ours with this marvelous story of evolution, which we participate in. It is our story. How often has this happened elsewhere? Now, there's a general uh, belief, you know, particularly of those who, uh, people, scientists who aren't uh, very good at biology. Um, but excellent in physics or astronomy, uh, to think that uh, evolution is a kind of deterministic thing, that once you get a life started, it will go on inevitably, and if you go on for 2,000 million years, maybe you could shorten the process, you will have intelligent beings like man at the end. This is a complete misunderstanding of the evolutionary story. It's an outrage, you might say, on what the biologists are trying to tell the rest of the scientific world as how they understand evolution. Evolution is not deterministic, it's opportunistic. It could have gone any way. There were all kinds of branches on these twigs, and the chances of one of these ultimate twigs finishing in creatures like ourselves is almost infinitely remote. Simpson, for example, is, uh, is quite uh, strong on this matter. The fossil record shows clearly that there is no central line le leading steadily in a goal-directed way from protozoan to man. There's been all these branches. Nothing is repeatable. And as he says, you cannot go back. Nothing can be recreated again. The dinosaurs are gone forever. This is in the whole mutational theory. You just can't, by mutations, throw back to the DNA structure that makes a dinosaur. The permutations and combinations of structure possible with a molecule as complex as DNA are beyond any calculating. And so you can really believe with Dobzhansky. This lack of predestination that I'm, uh, <coughs> gives rise, uh, sorry, he says, the view that if life exists anywhere in the universe, it is bound to result in the formation of man-like or even superman-like rational beings is not only questionable, but improbable to a degree which would usually mean rejection of a scientific hypothesis. I want you to think that this speck of dust that our president alluded to in his talk may, in the universe, be the only place where there is life. 
having given rise to conscious beings like ourselves. We will probably never know in any case, because of the remoteness of any other uh, chances for this, whether we are the only ones or not. So in that case, if it's unknowable, it's as good as uh, true that we are the only ones. I want to give you some feeling of the cosmic loneliness of man. Bound as he is forever on this planet. By bound, I mean he'll never live anywhere. He'll make hit and run raids on the moon and Mars, etc. But he will never colonize anything else. His colonizing days are finished. This colonizing, wandering Homo sapiens sapiens is, in fact, making some desperate, maniacal effort, if you might think, to go into space and explore it with the idea of colonizing it. But he will be beaten on that. We have to re fall back upon living on this earth as the only place where man will ever live. That is the one prediction I will make about what's going on in the other direction of the procession. We are forever earthbound. And therefore, let me say something else rather strange. Uh, I, I have become a pre-Copernican, if you know what that means. Uh, you know, Copernicus upset the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe by saying that the Earth went round the sun. And uh, this, as we now look at it, is a bit of trivial mechanics, and on, evolution, on uh, relativity theory means nothing much at all. And the only important thing that we can say about this Earth in its status in the universe is that it contains us. Our conscious life. The only people who can know and observe and think, the only astronomers who can tell us about or tell anybody or discover what the vastnesses of space and time are. And but for us here and those scientists who are ex looking out into space the whole of this universe could have been like a drama played before empty stalls, which means that it's not played at all. Well, now I have, I think, to go quite briefly over one or two other things because my time is running out. But I do want to now give you something in the way of a new look at ourselves in this evolutionary story. If I, as I said earlier, don't believe it gives a complete explanation of my origin, then what am I to think? Now, in the first place, I want you to realize that there's something we know for certain now, and which, or at least we should know, but is hardly realized by anybody. And that is, it isn't a genetic structure, unique as it is, that gives us a unique individuality. Now, I mean that. The same, there are people who have exactly the same genetic structure, human beings, the same genetic structure, and yet they know themselves to be just as different as any other two human beings. I refer to identical twins. By, made by the splitting of the fertilized ovum, so that each has an identical genetic basis for the development of their bodies. And of course, they look alike, but they are quite independent individuals. You may not think so, but they know how different they are. So that is certain then. Their uniqueness as consciously experiencing beings does not derive from uniqueness of DNA or unique genetic constitution. And it is the DNA story that is in the evolutionary story. That's what makes life. And the whole evolutionary pattern is DNA, DNA, DNA. And then at the end we find that DNA is not in fact operative in giving us our individuality. If you want another way to look at it, each of you who doesn't have an identical twin, there may be some in the room, but uh, the rest of us, of course, have got different uh, DNA uh, molecules in our genetic structure. But if this were to be true, that our individual, as distinct from uniovular twins, our individuality was tied to our DNA structure, 
Then we get together, and I quote, uh, think of Jennings, H.S. Jennings, a great American biologist, who wrote this 1930, and it's never been properly appreciated because it was delivered by Jennings in an age where there was the wrong climate of opinion. But I think the climate of opinion is coming around now, so that what Jennings wrote can now be fully appreciated. But the point is that if you consider each of ourselves and how we arose from a fertilized ovum and sperm to zoa, the chances of our particular genetic arrangement of DNA molecules is infinitely remote even in one or two generations. The chances against this particular DNA structure out of all of the fantastic numbers of DNA structures that human beings can have is so remote. Have we to imagine that this chance which is infinitely against it was what gave us our individuality? The answer is it's unthinkable. That the story must be wrong just as for uniovular twins, so for all of us. Uniqueness of DNA structure does not give our unique individuality that each of us experiences in himself. And if I am not tied then to this genetic structure, how do I explain my uniqueness? Now, this is something that we may come to discuss, and I throw some of this in the pool for discussion, as time is now almost running out. But I want you to appreciate that this is a fatal flaw, I think, in the story that would derive me completely from the evolutionary story. I don't, you see, I want, I'm in the evolutionary story, but I, all I am saying is that it does not fully explain my origin as a unique, individually self-conscious person. This is where we have then to cast our thoughts and inquiries in the future. And this is a real thing, because myself is the only first-hand reality that I have. Everything else is derivative. It's right at the core of the problem each of us has to face as to what we really are. In a sense, I think, and many of you will think that, and I would be very uh, much think this myself too, it comes to the idea that there is something additional to us besides our material origin. This mystery of our existence involves us in something very like the religious concept of the soul, if you like, which is a quite assimilable to these ideas. Something that transcends the biological account of each of our origins and our developing body. And this is, in fact, what a human being is with his self-consciousness, his own unique experiences of himself through a whole of his life, this existence of a human being, then, has got this ultimate mystery about it. And that this is not at all, this mystery is not at all relieved by the evolutionary story or explained by it. That is to say, so far as evolution is concerned, I want to say that I am in it, but not exclusively of it. And I want to leave this as a problem, a great perplexing problem, that we should be pursuing in our thought right at this time. When too often people have thought that man is denigrated because, first of all, his earth became just a little bit of dust in this immense universe, and secondly, he himself is apparently uh, merely the result of a biological process where chance and the survival of natural selection, chance and genetics, is, explains completely his origin. I want to say that I think this is uh, too uh, simple and only a partial explanation of us. I want to think that there can be, in the near future, some new concept 
if we feel this badly enough in science, somebody will come up with something like, came up with relativity in physics. And I feel that we need some revolutionary concept that I'll say in psychophysiology, if you like, equivalent and even much more important than relativity in physics, to give us some new understanding of ourselves. Don't think that uh, the, the use of relativity is wrong here. I want you to imagine, remember that everything we observe is a conscious experience. Even the problems we have to consciously to think about and we're turning back on ourselves all the time. That is, I think of brains and the action of brains using my brain to do that. You see what I mean? It's a very extraordinary uh, self-operating cycle that one gets oneself into. But it is the only thing we can have. And I hope that something like that may come soon to illuminate what I would call just darkness when we ask these fundamental questions. In the hundred years then, we have lived with the understanding of this evolutionary origin of ourselves. But I believe that we have not assimilated it conceptually. I believe that we are in urgent need of an evolutionary philosophy that will give us, as it were, a better understanding of this mystery of being, this existence that each of us has, taking all that is given us in the evolutionary story, but adding to it all that we know of ourselves in our richness of our personal and emotional and conscious life. In that way, we can think of evolution as a source of hope for man. It has, in fact, given us our body and skills. All of the kinds of performances that we can do are, in fact, the result of the evolutionary process developing this marvelous biological organism that we, in fact, are. But I feel that we must not think that explanations like this are final or complete or adequate. We must think we have further to go and that man must always be questing and unsatisfied with the explanations that he's got, questing for new and better explanations. And I hope very much that conferences like this will be the occasion for us rethinking the situation and making it the most urgent of all problems confronting man. As a final statement, I would like to quote in this theme from the Dead Sea Scrolls. A little three lines. So I walk on uplands unbounded and know that there is hope for that which thou didst mold out of dust to have concert with things eternal. I think we all sense that we have listened to a very significant lecture that has brought the human race a good way along its path, but also has brought us well into the subject of this third Nobel conference. You are invited to pass any questions that you may have jotted down on the question cards to the aisles. They will be taken up by the ushers. I think there will be time for comments on two or three. The rest will be reserved for the final panel when they will be given consideration. Will the ushers pass through the aisles to receive any cards that you may wish to turn in? You may be interested in this information, that in addition to students of 
Gustavus faculty and friends of the institution directly associated with it. There are present representatives from 39 colleges and from 83 high schools. We appreciate your being with us. The next lecture is at 1.30 in Alumni Hall in the Student Union. I have uh, uh, several questions here which I've just selected almost randomly. So I say that so that people won't be disappointed if their question isn't uh, dealt with now uh, from the pile and the others we will deal with later. Um, here is one that uh, I was sure was going to come up, so I'll start with it. Uh, though animals do not speak, do they communicate, for example, porpoises? And if so, doesn't this indicate that man may have at one time communicated without speaking? Of course. Uh, man, uh, before we got to the uh, complexities of a modern language with all its symbolism and so on, undoubtedly there were languages of a much more primitive kind. The point I was making in Susan Langer's quotation, and uh, this is important because I know the people who are studying languages today in New Guinea, is that all of the languages spoken by the human race today, and that's Homo sapiens sapiens, are the most complicated language. Don't think that these primitive Stone Age people in New Guinea, for example, that have never, which are, have got just the rudiments of any culture in the ordinary way, uh, in material way, they have a language with a vocabulary of 15,000 words, which is what Shakespeare had. And they have a grammar which is infernally complicated, and so on. They have all of this, although they haven't in much else. They haven't, uh, but uh, in the way of things that we regard as uh, even the primitive of, uh, levels of civilization uh, in the way of, for example, nothing to do with the working of metal, nothing to do with the workings of clay, only primitive wooden objects and so on, and very little in the way of clothing. But they at least have a language, and they use it all the time. <laughs> they never stop. But uh, the... Uh, but primitive man must have had, and this is where we can't go, you see, because nothing is written, nothing is known back there. The best we can do is to look at what's available in languages today and to look at the written languages, which, of course, were always already highly developed. But we can be certain that there were all grades of development of communication and complication, just as you might say children show this as they grow up. But they don't have to invent their language. They pick it up by imitation. The invention of a language is much harder than learning a language. Let's be clear about that. This is, must be a fantastically long and laborious process. As geniuses of, of uh, uh, grammatical geniuses must have existed in the human race right down in those early times to have made the languages and created the ways of expression unambiguously which exist. Uh, the porpoises have very little, just a few odd grunts and squeaks and noises and so on. Most disappointing because their brain looks almost as good as ours, but unfortunately I think it's clear that the porpoise uh, doesn't know what language is in the ordinary sense of the word. Now, uh, perhaps the answer, asker of that question may like to ask me more later on. Uh, Another one, well, do you believe that someday we will be able to abstract DNA codes from dead or past forms as from bones? Of course, not at all. Uh, bones that are left in the fossil remains are simply calcareous or at least often simply uh, natural uh, um, fluids coming and uh, seeping down through the rock and, and outlining the bones and so on. There's nothing at all possible there. The DNA code goes out fast within a few hours, you might say, of death. Um, no, we have not much more to go on than what has been found. I think you must realize that the people who have spent their lives questing for the remains of man and the animal forms and so on are doing some of the most wonderful and dedicated scientific work today and some of the most interesting and important work. Man must examine this earth 
for everything he can know about the past of life. This should be one of the top priorities. It's one that countries should vie with one another in the expenditure of money and equipping and so on, work to be done of this kind, because it is our story, the only story perhaps in the universe of this kind, and we should struggle to know it. Do you see, uh, what do you see as to the effects of chemical stimulations, LSD, etc., on the rate of the evolutionary process? I don't know what LSD has to do with this, by the way, but, uh, <laughs> except that it might, uh, shall we say, if the human race were to take to uh, this kind of drug stimulations to enlarge its fields of experience, or whatever these devotees say, then I can well believe we're on the way down fast. Uh, we have to live in a, le a real world, not a world of these hallucinatory imaginations. And the people who are electing in this free society to lead their lives that way are purely parasitic on this world and, uh, and also, as we say, a real danger. And there's nothing to be said for them otherwise. Uh, I have another one which is really something that I already had dealt with. At what point on the scale of evolution and phylogenesis does conscious awareness arise? The answer to that is I don't know. Uh, it's I don't know, uh, even with an animal we, right before me. If you could bring in a dog, I couldn't tell you. And no one can tell you if this animal has conscious of, if he knows that he's a dog, you see, I, uh, knows that he knows. Of course he knows in the ordinary sense of the use of the word, knows and can do kinds of clever things and learn and all the rest of it. And I don't deny that he may have some uh, conscious experience of a kind of dim and shadowy kind of what we have. But there's only one way to know and that's to be a dog. And then you wouldn't be interested. <laughs> Please don't think I'm against the animals. I love them. And, uh, <laughs> but I want to be realistic about it. A and we can, of course, and I don't want to upset people who love to imagine uh, the kind of human person almost their pets are. Uh, no, I wouldn't dream. This is a nice uh, social uh, convention, and let's go on with it. It helps everybody. But it isn't science, and it isn't getting us anywhere to think of things that way. Uh, if we're trying to answer questions in a realistic manner, we have to realize how uh, many questions we can ask cannot be answered. And this is, you can't just say to your dog, you know, uh, are you conscious and how do you like your bone or something and he wags his tail, that doesn't tell you. Uh, the only thing that could tell you would be if he could talk, if you could have symbolic communication with him, as we can with all other human beings today. There's no question about their consciousness because you can talk to them, you can learn their language and communicate with them and you can find out that primitive, primitive as they are, they are beings like yourself. It's quite easy, as a matter of fact, to get on beam with these people. It's quite amazingly easy, primitive as they are. Uh, and you know, it's, uh, uh, it's the same in uh, My Fair Lady and all that. You have to just take people and dress them up and make them pronounce the words the right way and they can be one of us. Well, <laughs> and this is true of primitive people. Their children can grow easily grow and become alumni and very distinguished alumni of Gustavus Adolphus, for example, or what you will, and you could take them from New Guinea, from the most primitive Stone Age people. In one generation, straight away, they can make it. But no animal can go anywhere. As I said, even a chimp can take, uh, after two or three years of work, can learn three words and then only use them uh, with difficulty. So this is the difference between man and animals. If we only could have really primitive ancestors of man to work with, then there'd be tremendous problems. But they don't exist and there's no way of bringing them back. That part of the problem has gone for good, I'm afraid. Or perhaps